Welcome back to week six. This segment will focus on defamation. Defamation laws protect an individual reputation from unwarranted attacks. There is little dispute that defamation laws can serve a legitimate purpose and it is recognized internationally as a valid ground for restricting freedom of expression. However, around the world, defamation laws, civil and criminal, and defamation charges are often abused, resulting in a violation of freedom of expression and information. In this segment, we will first define defamation. I will then highlight some of the way a balance has been reached between the protection of freedom of expression and the protection of reputation. We will then turn our attention to criminal defamation and the trends toward decriminalization. In the next segment, I will explore some of the ways the internet and information technology have impacted on defamation. So let's begin. First of all, what do we mean by defamation? Article 17 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights defines the right to reputation as the protection against unlawful attacks on a person's reputation. As we have already discussed in previous week, the protection of reputation can constitute a legitimate restriction to freedom of expression. In fact, it is specifically listed under Article 19 of the International Covenant as a valid ground for restrictions. And it is also listed by various regional conventions. The purpose of defamation laws is to protect people from statements that cause damage to their reputation. In fact, let me rephrase that. It's protecting people from false statements that cause damage to their reputation. And I will explain that distinction later. In some countries, the right to reputation is protected under laws of libel, slander, insult, or desacato, particularly uh, that last one in Latin America. Defamation can be a criminal offense or a civil one. As a criminal offense, defamation can be prosecuted by the state and it may result in actual imprisonment. Defamation constitutes the largest single category of free speech related cases and the most global in its outreach, I mean uh, within court and, and tribunals. Defamation also constitutes one of the largest causes of free speech related imprisonment and damages around the world. So defamation is uh, one of the main focus for press freedom and freedom of expression um, activists, along with national security, which we will consider um, uh, in the following segment. Crucially, reputation claims have moved forcefully into the online world and have created many challenges which will be explored later. But let me give you an example. In January 2016, so very recently, a freelance journalist in Uganda posted a story on his Facebook page which alleged that a public official was implicated in the theft of about 200 heads of cattle from the farm of another public official. That particular journalist was then charged with criminal libel for this Facebook post under the Penal Code Act on li libel from, from Uganda. So even uh, a Facebook post can bring you into a court of justice for, for defamation. There is a very large jurisprudence on defamation, both criminal and civil, which cannot be reported here. Uh, what I will do instead is highlight the principal norms in terms of finding the right balance between the right to protect one's reputation and freedom of expression. How can this balance be reached? So this is what judges have told us. And of course, uh, these are the best practice. Um, they are not always followed, unfortunately. So what, what do judges tell us about this balance? The first um, important element is that of truth. Truth should be an absolute defense to a suit or charges of defamation. 
if something is true, it cannot be defamatory. Let's put it very simply. If something is true, it cannot amount to a defamation. A second element of that balancing act between reputation and free speech is the concept of reasonable publication. That means that if um, a publication is reasonable, then it may be justified even if it is not wholly true. So let me give you an example. If a journalist made good faith effort to prove the truth of the statement and believed it to be true, then the concept of reasonable publication applies and there should not be any uh, finding of defamation. It is um, a complex um, concept, but which makes sense in the, in the context particularly of, of media and good faith reporting. The third element of that balancing act between reputation and free speech is that of opinion. A statement complained of, uh, which is not a statement of fact, but an expression of opinion, cannot be defamatory. Far lower standards should be applied to satire as well, because such a statement as well was not intended to, um, to cause harm. It's about humor, it's about satire. So there are some kind of speech uh, that should never be found to be defamatory and others for which lower uh, kind of threshold should be applied. Um, a fourth element regarding that um, balancing act is the, the concept of absolute privilege. What we mean here is that if a statement was reported from Parliament or from judicial proceeding, neither the original author of the statement nor the media that reported on it could be found to have defamed someone. So the, the last element related to the balance between free speech and reputation is a statement of others. Journalists in particular, and that includes bloggers as we know now, cannot be responsible for the statement of others, provided that they have not themselves endorsed those statements. This would apply, for instance, in the case of a live interview broadcast, but also in, um, in any kind of media reporting. So all those five elements have been found to be quite essential to reaching a proper balance between freedom of expression and the protection of reputation. Let's now turn our attention to one form of defamation which is particularly problematic, criminal defamation, and the many chilling effect it creates for free speech. Around the world, human rights organizations advocate against the use of criminal proceeding for reputation-related issues. They are advancing several reasons to campaign against criminal defamation, and I will highlight a few here. The first is that criminal defamation has a manifest chilling effect on freedom of expression. This is well highlighted by a recent decision from the Zimbabwe Constitutional Court, which ruled in its conclusion against criminal defamation. And I'm going to quote the, uh, the court here. The harmful and undesirable consequences of criminalizing defamation versus the chilling possibilities of arrest, detention, and two years imprisonment are manifestly excessive in their effect. Moreover, there is an appropriate and satisfactory alternative civil remedy that is available to combat the mischief of defamation. Put differently, the offense of criminal defamation constitute a disproportionate instrument for achieving the intended objective of protecting the reputations, rights, and freedom of other persons. So that's, um, I think, a, a remarkable statement and one that is now quoted throughout uh, Africa uh, for its uh, very positive and progressive implications for free speech. In fact, it's quoted even outside Africa. 
uh, a second um, characteristic of criminal defamation was well highlighted by the Press Freedom Organization, MLDI, whose executive director you will uh, meet virtually in a supplementary vi video, uh, Peter Norlander. So this um, organization said, and I quote, the danger with criminal defamation is that the involvement of the state in prosecuting alleged defamers shift the matter very quickly into the punishment of dissent. At the least, it gives additional and excessive protection to officials and government. You understand that when uh, we deal with criminal law, the prosecution is conducted by the state. And what that means is that it is the state that is responsible for implementing and imprisoning directly uh, those that are being found guilty of defamation. You may also recall that this is a level of state involvement that the US First Amendment has uh, prohibited uh, fairly strongly. But that's not the only one. So does the American Court for Human Rights, or indeed also with less force, the European Court, which um, has stated repeatedly that criminal defamation was um, not the best way of dealing with criminal, with uh, reputation claims, uh, but it has not uh, very clearly stated its opposition yet to criminal defamation. Still, the, the record is that at, at the European court level, uh, criminal defamation is definitely not encouraged. Still around the world, hundreds of people are routinely the object of criminal defamation proceeding, ending in prison more often than not, uh, and, uh, and uh, many uh, financial uh, fines. Another uh, particularity of criminal defamation, which is very worrying, uh, because according to uh, press freedom organizations and observers uh, of freedom of expression in general, it appears to be increasing. Uh, criminal defamation may be used not only uh, for the reputation of individuals, but also to protect the reputation of a symbol or an institution. So it's not only about powerful people using reputation threats to maintain their power. It is also about established systems and institutions, political or religious, using the notion of reputation to protect and maintain their grip over society. By the way, this is not just a problem in non-democratic system, although it's certainly very acute there. The notion of defamation as applied to state, government or the officials have been found by repeated courts to pose a grave danger to freedom of expression and democratic values. As a result, they have been continuously criticized by human rights treaty bodies and by experts. For instance, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and its Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression have stated that laws punishing defamation of the state or of its institutions I quote, conflict with the belief that freedom of expression and opinion is a touchstone of all freedoms to which the United Nations is consecrated and one of the soundest guarantees of modern democracy. The UN Special Rapporteur on the promotion and protection of the right to freedom of expression has declared that criminal defamation laws may not be used to protect abstract or subjective notions or concepts such as a state, national symbol, national identity, cultures, school of thought, religions, ideologies, or political doctrine. International human rights law protects individuals and group of people, not abstract notions or institutions that are subject to scrutiny, comment, or criticism. The European Court as well has clarified that a king, a president or a prime minister being the symbol of the state cannot be shielded from legitimate criticism as this would amount to an overprotection of the heads of state. So 
Um, the uh, situation right now regarding criminal defamations are a that it continues to be used around the world. Indeed, it is one of the primary charges related to freedom of expression. And two, that its use has been uh, progressively over particularly the last decade uh, increased to uh, include notions, abstract symbols, uh, as well as the state or the government. Even though criminal defamation is still largely the norm in the majority of countries around the world, the trend over the last decade is one of decriminalization. By this, I mean a process by which court or government have moved away from either the use of criminal sanctions or indeed the existence of criminal uh, legislations regarding defamation. That trend is supported by standard enunciated by international human rights body which have repeated that defamation should not be punishable by imprisonment. Let me give you an example or two. The Human Rights Committee, which is, as you remember, the uh, UN body of experts that is responsible for overseeing the implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. The Human Rights Committee, in its General Comment 34, uh, published in 2013, recommended that state parties should consider the decriminalization of defamation and in any case, the application of the criminal law should only be countenanced in the most serious of cases, and imprisonment is never an appropriate penalty for crimes related to a reputation. International and regional human rights bodies, including the UNESCO, the Council of Europe, and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, have also called for reform of criminal defamation law and for the decriminalization of, um, of the law. So as the African Commission on Peoples and Human Rights, which already in 2010 released its resolution on repealing criminal defamation laws, observing that, and I quote, criminal defamation laws constitute a serious interference with freedom of expression. It impedes on the role of the media as a watchdog, preventing journalists and media practitioners to practice their profession without fear and in good faith. These positions have been further backed up by the regional and international jurisprudence. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights has repeatedly ruled that criminal defamation was disproportionate and violated the right to freedom of expression. In a 2014 case against Portugal, the European Court of Human Rights stressed that journalists should never be imprisoned for defamation and that criminal defamation law should not be used when there is a civil law alternative. The court emphasized that the criminal conviction of the journalist is manifestly disproportionate per se, because the remedy is always available under civil law. So by their uh, very nature, uh, defamation laws, uh, criminal defamation laws are not meeting the three-part test, which um, has been highlighted in the previous weeks. In 2014, the African Court on Human and People's Rights in Kanate versus the Republic of Burkina Faso held that there were strict limits to potential punishment for criminal defamation. In particular, defamation cannot be sanctioned by custodial sentences without going contrary to freedom of expression provisions. The court also held that all other punishment, including fines and civil or administrative penalties, are subject to the principle of necessity and proportionality. Thus, if they were excessive, they will also run in violation of the African Charter on Human and People Rights and other human rights instruments. Here again, we have a very progressive ruling by the African Court uh, on, on Human Rights and a ruling that is currently being implemented 
of course, by uh, Burkina Faso, but also by a range of other countries in, uh, in the continent. That's um, one among a number of other examples in Africa, in Latin America and in Europe, which has seen uh, courts determining that criminal defamation is either not appropriate or is, um, is a disproportionate um, punishment for the crimes related to uh, reputation. Most importantly, a number of governments have adopted laws that decriminalized some aspect of defamation, so it's a partial decriminalization, and in a fewer number of cases, completely abolished the offense of criminal defamation. So while a majority of countries still have criminal defamation in their books, for close to 10 years now, decriminalization has emerged as a clear trend. For instance, in Europe, defamation was decriminalized in Montenegro, in the United Kingdom, in Ireland, in Romania, in Armenia, all of that uh, over the last two or three years. Of course, I, I do not want to give the impression that there is no longer uh, criminal defamation around the world. Quite, this, is, this is quite not the case. But um, there is a trend for the last decade which is moving us towards a decriminalization of defamation. And this is a trend that is welcomed and this is a trend that must be encouraged. So to sum up, the protection of reputation uh, against uh, defamation constitutes a valid ground for the restriction of freedom of expression under international human rights law. There are well-established ways which allows for a balance to be reached between the right to freedom of expression and the protection of reputation, such as the, uh, the defense of truth. Any kind of statement that is true can never be uh, defamatory. Unfortunately, these lessons, these uh, ways of balancing reputation with defamation are not always well applied. And in fact, um, throughout the world, criminal or indeed civil defamation remain a major cause of uh, imprisonment but in more generally of um, violation of freedom of expression. It remains in the books of the majority of countries around the world and result in imprisonment. On the positive side, as I have mentioned earlier, there is no doubt that decriminalization of defamation is an emerging trend which is backed by international and regional standard setting bodies. Thank you very much.